One year ago today, the Springboks smashed the All Blacks in the 2023 Rugby World Cup Final. In this video, you are going to get a front row seat as I share my personal memories from that wonderful occasion with you. Now, my wife had actually just given birth to our second daughter. In fact, to be quite accurate, it had occurred 10 days before the final. She and the newborn baby came downstairs to join me in the living room, but of course, with the baby having quite an unusual sleeping pattern, by adult standards at least, we had to kind of keep a little bit quiet so we couldn't cheer too loudly while baby was sleeping. Now, to be sure, the Springboks came into this match as the favourites. I am 100% convinced of that. If you have a look at what happened before that Rugby World Cup started, the Springboks had momentum. We had annihilated the All Blacks 35-7 in the Qatar Airways Cup match. The All Blacks, in addition to losing that one, also lost their opening match of the Rugby World Cup to the host nation France. Don't forget that the box actually beat the French in the quarterfinals in what was, let's be honest, an epic encounter. Now let's have a look at how the two teams actually got to that Rugby World Cup final. We'll start with the Springboks. The opening match was a win against Scotland, a nice 18-3 victory in Marseille. That was followed by smashing Romania 76-0. And then a little bit of a speed hump, losing to Ireland 13-8. And that was finished off with a big win over Tonga, 49-18. One of you guys might remember that actually going into that Tongan match, there was a lot of confusion about whether or not we would actually make the quarterfinals even if we won. You might recall that there was a lot of permutations at that stage. And there was one suggestion that if Scotland beat Ireland by a big enough score, they would overtake the Springboks and it would be the Scots and the Irish that went through. But I think if we're very honest with each other, even though there was a little bit of nervousness on our part, I don't think any of us really truly thought that the Scots were ever going to beat Ireland. And then it was on to the quarterfinals. As alluded to, that epic win over the French at the Stade de France, 29-28, unbelievable. Uh, I think that, that Cheslin Colby charge down off the uh, Thomas Ramos conversion will forever live in our memories. And then, of course, that nice win over England, 16-15. Remember, we were trailing, we were in big trouble, and we pulled the rabbit out of the hat. Now let's have a look at how the All Blacks got to the final. It started off with an opening match defeat to Le Bleu, 27-13. That's actually France's biggest ever win over the Kiwis. Well, they did bounce back by smashing Namibia 71-3. And then, dear, oh dear, poor old Italy. They were in the firing line, weren't they? New Zealand winning 96-17, and that was followed by a 73-0 annihilation of Uruguay. Then in the quarterfinals, they came up against Ireland. A lot of people thought that the Irish were going to be the favourites and would emerge victorious. I must admit, I was one of those who backed Ireland to actually get the win. But then the old Irish quarterfinal Rugby World Cup curse once again came into play. New Zealand emerging victorious 28-24 and then they annihilated Argentina 44-6 in the semi-final. Now I won't lie to you, despite that massive win in the semi-final and despite our narrow victory over the English, I still thought that we would win the match. Firstly, we are not Argentina, we are not as easy for New Zealand to combat as Los Pumas are, and we all knew that after that epic quarterfinal against the French, that win over England, it was always going to be a difficult one to achieve. The reality is that at elite professional sports level, it takes so much out of you, not only physically, but also mentally, to pull off a win like we did in that quarterfinal against France. And that's why, guys, it's often very difficult for any sports team to pull off a second win after going through so much, especially mentally, in a previous match. Argentina are a really good example of that right now. Look at what they did in the Rugby Championship, not only this year, but also in 2022. They beat the All Blacks one week, and then the very next week against the same opponents, it's the same players, they get a beating and a bad one at that. 
Now, I always knew that with the Rugby World Cup final, there would be a different mentality. The Springboks love playing in finals. And New Zealand, coming into it, had only ever lost a World Cup final against us. And of course, you'll remember that was 1995. But this was 2023. We had waited 28 years for the dream final to once again appear. And in the second minute, it was bad news for New Zealand when Shannon Frizzell was rightly shown a yellow card. He was lucky, I thought for his supposedly accidental fall on Bongi Mbonambi's leg. And that put the Springboks under some serious pressure. You may remember we went into that final with a 7-1 bench split. So we only had the one backline player. So that's not a crisis, but it is a little bit of a problem when you only have two recognized hookers in the squad. That was Malcolm Marks being the other one. And remember, he was injured. So he didn't actually participate, and that left us with Bongi Mbonambi to pretty much play every match at the Rugby World Cup, as well as Dion Furi. Now, we love Dion. Dion is a legend, but let's be honest, he's not a specialized hooker. And that meant that he was going to have to give us 78 minutes as a hooker in the Rugby World Cup final. Could he do it? Well, of course, we now know that he could, and we're delighted that he did that. And what a special moment for Dion to have been able to pull that off as well. But we were nervous at that moment because we knew Dion would probably come on at some stage and probably play hooker, but we were kind of hoping that Bongi would play more than two minutes. Nevertheless, the All Blacks down to 14 men. Andre Pollard kicked a few uh, penalties and for New Zealand, Richie Mwanga did uh, one of his own and that took the box into a 9-3 lead early on in that final. That took us up to the 28th minute and that's when a lot of people believe that the match changed. And I agree that it changed, I just don't agree with the sentiment at which those people claim that it changed. So 28 minutes in, JC Creel is on the receiving end of a vicious tackle from Sam Kane. And there was head contact and it meant that Sam Kane was red carded, the first man actually ever to be red carded in a Rugby World Cup final. You might want to remember that one for your next pub quiz night. And so the All Blacks Earlier, down to 14 men, but at least Frizzell came back onto the field. Now, down to 14 men, and no one was coming back on. And this might tell us why the Kiwis are so keen on this 20-minute red card nonsense. Nevertheless, Pollard would kick another penalty, so would Mwanga, and the halftime score was South Africa 12, New Zealand 6. Now, that boded very well for us because it had never happened in the history of the Rugby World Cup that a team leading at halftime would go on and lose. If you're ahead at halftime, you always go on and win that Webb Ellis Cup. So, South Africa in a very strong position at the break. That said, the All Blacks were probably back in the game in the 45th minute when Sia Colisi, our captain, received a yellow card for what looked like a high tackle. Now, luckily, the replays showed that Sia actually attempted to lower himself while going into that tackle, and that's what saved him as he escaped the fate of Sam Kane. But interesting that both captains for the two respective teams were on the receiving end of cards in this final and both of them actually quite similar kind of tackles. The difference of course is that Kane didn't make any attempt to lower his head and that's why he was red carded and Sia was allowed to come back onto the field 10 minutes after receiving his red uh, yellow card. I beg your pardon. And while Sia was off the field, the All Blacks took advantage. Aaron Smith went over for a try, but cheaters never prosper. The try was ruled out for a knock-on earlier in the move. It was uh, a line-out that led to the move going down that left-hand side, but it was in the line-out from the moment uh, that the ball left the line-out into the back line. That's where the knock-on actually took place. However, New Zealand would get their try four minutes later when Bowden Barrett crossed the line. That would actually make him the only man to score tries in two different Rugby World Cup finals. That's another one for your pub quiz. And crucially, Mwanga missed the conversion. Now, that's another very important point that we'll come to at the end of this discussion. There was a horror moment in the 74th minute when Cheslin Colby was yellow carded for a deliberate knock-on. Guys, if you've watched enough of this channel, you'll know my thoughts on that deliberate knock-on yellow card law. 
as much as I can't stand it, the reality is that it is one of rugby's laws. And so Cheslin was off and I will never forget seeing the images of him sitting on the sidelines in tears. Because let's be honest, if that happened to you, what would you be thinking? You would probably be thinking, oh my word, I have cost my country the Rugby World Cup. Thankfully, he didn't. And we do have Geordie Barrett to thank for that, in a way. He missed a penalty that would have put New Zealand in front. But you know what? When the ball goes wide, or if it hits the posts, that indicates that it is not three points or two points in Mwanga's case. And South Africa maintained their 12-11 lead. And by the time Wayne Barnes blew the final whistle, it was still 12-11 to the Springboks. And we were the Rugby World Champions for the fourth time. No other country in the history of the tournament has won the tournament as many times as we have. Now, I want to tell you something else as well. In 1995, I cried when we won the tournament. Not at the final whistle. I actually cried after Joel Stransky kicked that drop goal. It was almost as if little boy me knew that that was the clincher. But I cried in 95. I didn't cry in 07 when we won. And I still think that maybe it's because there was just too much inevitability about it, given that the All Blacks and the Wallabies had lost in the quarterfinals and we had smashed England 36-0 in the pool stage. It just felt like a bit of a procession after that. Uh, maybe that is why I didn't cry. That doesn't take away from a fabulous achievement, by the way. It's forever special that we did win that 07 Rugby World Cup. And then in 2019, I cried again after the match. Uh, this time when Sio was giving his uh, talk, his post-match uh, interview. And he spoke about how South Africa is a country that is going through all kinds of problems. But if we all stick together and we all work together, we can overcome them. And that, that's just what caused me to, to begin crying. And I didn't cry this time, funny enough. But you know what did happen? The very next morning, when I was looking at images of the match, I saw a picture of Bongim Bonambi with his gold medal around his neck and his little baby daughter, well, I say baby daughter, probably three-year-old girl uh, in his arms. And I just imagined that that was me with, wouldn't you just know it, my daughter, who was three years old at that stage. I'm not talking about the little baby, so I've got two. Uh, now you know that about me, two daughters. I was imagining me with my three-year-old in my arms and a gold medal, and I began crying. So that was uh, the... Um, straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. Very special memories indeed. And so with that in mind, I'd like to ask you, what were you doing for the 2023 Rugby World Cup final? Who did you watch it with? What are your memories of that occasion? Did you cry at the final whistle or were you able to keep it all inside? Let me know in the comment section down below. I'd love to know what you think and what your thoughts are. And by the way, if you're still watching, and I assume that you are enjoying this video, if you still are, there's something that I would like to ask of you. Would you like to help me out? I'd like to go to the 2027 Rugby World Cup for you and provide you with daily content from that tournament but I'm going to need a little bit of financial assistance to make it happen you can help me by going over to my patreon page and signing up as a patron if you look down below you will see a link to my patron page and you can click there sign up become a patron it starts from as little as five dollars a month I know that's about 85 rand these days Hey, the rand is not what it once was, hey? But if you'd like, you can even give me 10, 15, 20, 100. You can give me 1 million if you like. Uh, that's US dollars, not SIM dollars, of course. Uh, it's entirely up to you. I will be forever grateful, whatever contribution it is that you would like to make. By the way, if you're not yet ready to sign up as a patron, why don't you just uh, spear tackle the like button down there. You can even crock roll it if you like. And if you haven't yet done so, I'd encourage you to subscribe to this channel. And before I say goodbye, since we're talking about the Rugby World Cup, I have done some exclusive interviews with Rugby World Cup winners of Springbok Persuasion, of course. And I've put together an entire playlist where I have interviewed more than 20 Springbok Rugby World Cup winners. Go check the playlist out over here. Click on any of the videos and enjoy them. And something else that I've also done about a year ago, I put together a review of the 2023 Rugby World Cup final. A little bit like this video, but probably a little bit more in-depth and analytical. And if you'd like to go and watch that one and recall the special memories of 2023, that video is over here. And I will see you in the next video.